big goat we slurping. Listen, I eat more fast food than half you asking to pass through your brain. No hassle. How you think I'm real? Welcome to our usual food literacy for all. It's Tuesday evening, planted in history, a food future informed by the by the past. Today we have Marsha Catalan who will be talking about franchise, her book, The Golden Arches in Black America, a talk about food and racial justice. Next slide. This course is co-led by Dr. Marco Finn and myself, Shakira Tyler. Next slide, please. And we also have more team members that make this course possible. Megan, Nyexi, Kimmy, Sammy, and Chris, as you all know by now. And a big thank you to the School for Environment and Sustainability, the Center for Education and Women, and the Francis and Sydney Lewis Visiting Leaders Fund, all of our sponsors. And there are always multiple ways to engage. You could go to X and you could also use the poll questions. And of course, our, the classes are filmed and available on the Sustainable Food Systems Initiative website. Next slide. And now we're going to go to Megan. Good evening, everyone. Um, so this evening, we are going to hear an introduction to our talk from Farah. I don't think I can play it. Thank you. Chapter five of Franchise the Golden Arches in Black America was very insightful, as I was not aware of the group Soul of a Nation prior to reading it. This group composed of Black McDonald's franchisees that offered customers an inclusive lesson on African Americans in American history. Before reading this chapter, I had little knowledge on efforts made to enhance people's understanding of Black history through McDonald's. Soul of a Nation brought together scholars from different universities such as Cleveland State and Wayne State University and established a Black Studies program to represent the experiences of African Americans in United States history. One aspect of the reading that resonated with me was the challenges faced by Black franchisees of McDonald's and Burger King in funding national advertising. Despite contributing a percentage of profits or fees for ads, national campaigns exclusively featured white actors and models. As a result, franchisees had to resort to creating small-scale promotions to reach their target audience or advocate for the inclusion of special advertising tailored to their market. This issue still persists today. Reflecting on under underrepresentation of minority communities in the healthcare system and food systems. For instance, in one of my health promotion courses, a key aspect is inclusion of various minorities in advertisements to enhance inclusion and foster a sense of belonging. It aims to make individuals from diverse minorities, minority groups feel welcome and accepted. However, this sense of belonging must stem from equitable and ethical standpoint, which is something that the reading prompts you to question from a franchise such as McDonald's. Thank you, Farah, for your reaction um, to the reading from Dr. Marsha Chatland's book. I would love to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Marsha Chatland is an endowed professor of Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, where she is a scholar and teacher of African American life and culture. Her first book, Southside Girls Growing Up in the Great Migration, reimagined the mass exodus of Black Southerners to the urban North from the perspective of girls and teenage women. She'll speak to us about her latest book, the Pulitzer Prize winning franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America, which examines the intersection of the post-1968 civil rights struggle and the rise of the fast food industry. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Marcia Chatlin. I will pass the mic to you. Hi, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm going to make sure I'm not. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Marcia Chatlin, and it is a pleasure to be here. I have great regard for the University of Michigan and the Ann Arbor community, and it's great to be with you uh, virtually. So um, as someone who has spent a good portion of my academic career and um, my personal life engaged with the issue of McDonald's, I have a few quick questions for you to see your familiarity with the Golden Arches. So we have a poll started here. And I'm going to start with the first question. What year was McDonald's founded? And the answer to that question will be answered in the presentation. And as people answer that question, can we move on to the next? All right. Okay. So a lot of what I talk about is the rise of McDonald's. What restaurant is not 
one of the top three fast food chains in the U.S. today. So when we think about the very popular, popular fast food chains, um, which one is not included in the top three? All right. And as folks register that answer, let's go to the third poll question. Which U.S. president supported a bill that would make the minimum wage lower for teenagers? Which of these four U.S. presidents supported what they called a McWage, which would lower the minimum wage for teenagers who um, presumptively were the critical mass of fast food workers? All right. Now that we've thought a little bit about fast food, we can dive into the presentation. So my book, Franchise the Golden Arches in Black America, is a fast food story of McDonald's and a McDonald's story of fast food. And one of the reasons why I wrote this book is that I was particularly concerned with the ways that people were talking about fast food as related to communities of color. For many years, we've seen um, articles and reports um, of an alarming nature about the relationship between African-American communities particularly, but broadly communities of color and their consumption of fast food. And I wanted to be able to use history as a way of understanding how did McDonald's, which in many ways symbolized the mid-century um, dream of the white suburbs and of all white communities, how did a brand that was so associated with one set of realities become associated with African-American communities, particularly in inner city America? And so I wanted to historicize the ways that we talk about constructions like the obesity crisis, the ideas of food deserts or food apartheid by looking at the historical forces that brought fast food into black communities. Next slide. So, uh, all right, I, uh, okay. I see, now I have my clicker. Um, so the first kind of entry point into this study started with this guy. He was the former president of the United States, Bill Clinton. And before he became a vegan, he was an avid fast food consumer. When I was a kid and he was running for president, people sometimes made fun of him because he would go on long jogs and stop at McDonald's with his secret service. And when he was on the campaign trail, he was known to eat McDonald's. Now, before there was a president in the form of President Trump, the idea of a U.S. president eating McDonald's was considered a novel idea because of the associations with fast food. But what made me think a little bit more critically about fast food was this passage from novelist Toni Morrison in The New Yorker in 1998. Some of you may have heard the expression that Bill Clinton was America's first Black president. And this quote actually comes from this Toni Morrison essay, but very few people have actually taken the time to read the origins of this essay. And what she writes is that after all, Clinton displays almost every trope of blackness, single parent household, born poor, working class saxophone playing, McDonald's and junk food loving boy from Arkansas. What Morrison was talking about was her critiques of the news media and of Congress during Clinton's impeachment trials. And she said that in many ways, Clinton was being pursued by the justice system the way African-Americans are pursued with no sense of mercy and a kind of relentlessness. And what she was suggesting was part of what was irritating the segments of the population that were coming out against Clinton wasn't so much his behavior, but this idea that he had these tropes of blackness. And one of the things I thought was really interesting about this essay is that of all the characteristics that are associated with the stereotypes of blackness, how does McDonald's fit into that frame? Everyone around the world knows what McDonald's is more or less. People across the country, regardless of their race or their age or their socioeconomic background, know what McDonald's is and probably has eaten there. But there's a way in which McDonald's becomes black in the late 1960s and early 70s that was really intriguing to me and I think really necessary if we want to make thoughtful and culturally relevant and informed interventions in what we call healthy eating or food justice. 
And so in thinking about Bill Clinton and thinking about the ways his consumption of McDonald's was racialized, I was also thinking about the different places in which McDonald's appears in the frame. In the summer of 2014, after the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, by Officer Darren Wilson, we saw the emergence of a mass mobilization against police brutality and incredible scrutiny of the American justice and legal and economic system that often left Black people behind. Ferguson, Missouri was also one of the largest platforms for the mobilization of the movement for Black lives. And during the Ferguson protests in August of 2014, I noticed how often McDonald's appeared in the frame in the live reports from the St. Louis excerpt. Why was it that the McDonald's in many ways seemed to be the anchor of Ferguson, Missouri? What did it mean for reporters to spend a lot of time reporting from in front of the McDonald's or the fact that many reporters spent time at this McDonald's using the free Wi-Fi and the air conditioning, that this McDonald's was considered a staging ground for police and the National Guard, and it was also the site of protesters desperate to get milk to relieve the sting from tear gas that was deployed in the night of, um, during the nights of protest. And so in thinking about Ferguson, Missouri, and this moment in which we see a racial uprising, I started to think about this one. And this is Washington, D.C. in 1968, after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Many of you may be familiar with the incredible reaction to King's assassination, which happened almost um, uh, 56 years from, ago on April 4th, 1968. And the uprisings that emerged out of that assassination really gave a lot of people a lot of pause about the future of the civil rights movement and what the way forward was gonna look like in the absence of Martin Luther King Jr. Now, how are these connected to McDonald's? Well, it was in this moment of crisis in the United States in which we saw mass um, mobilizations on the ground, we saw confrontations with police brutality, we saw property damage in major urban areas, we saw people demanding new things from the federal government as a result of the injustices that had not been repaired with the civil rights movement despite the legislative victories and despite the success of some elements of the civil rights movement, people are asking different questions. And in that process, many communities were asking for more economic opportunities in the form of black owned businesses. And this may seem familiar to you for those who followed very closely the George Floyd summer of 2020, that a lot of communities were trying to mobilize for greater economic opportunities. And part of that request was more investment in black owned businesses, larger companies saying that they would support black owned creators, more people talking about this idea of the need to build black wealth. Well, these aren't new ideas. And in fact, in the 1960s, when people were calling for greater black economic power in something called black capitalism, this is what facilitated the entry of the fast food industry into inner city communities. And that's what my story is about. It's about fast food franchising and race. Now, many people are not familiar with the franchise concept, even though many of us uh, go to franchises on the daily basis. A franchise is a company that basically sets the rules and terms of engagement and gives you permission to run an outlet of their business. So if you are a McDonald's franchisee, you don't fully own that McDonald's, but you've been given the right to create and run a McDonald's business. There are franchises in all sorts of industries. If you ever ship things at a UPS store, that's a franchise. If you've ever stayed at a Hampton Inn, if you've ever gone to an Ace Hardware, they are a type of franchise model where there's a local owner, but there's a national or international company that sets the advertising, that sets the menus, that sets the goods and services that are provided. So in the United States, we have about 760,000 franchises and a quarter of those franchise businesses, or rather a third of those franchise businesses are fast food restaurants. So now that you know a little bit about franchises, uh, the question I asked you about the top three fast food franchises in the United States 
Chipotle is not one of them because Chipotle is not a franchise, but Subway, Starbucks, and uh, Starbucks is not a franchise either. It is on a limited basis, but that's neither here nor there. Starbucks, Subway, and McDonald's are the three kind of fast food outlets that are most popular in the United States. So starting with um, the history of McDonald's, we see the ways that race and food justice has long shaped the brand even before they entered African-American communities. In my book, I try to tell the story about McDonald's from the lens of racial justice by focusing on the founders of McDonald's who established McDonald's in 1940, the first location in San Bernardino, California. And the McDonald's brothers were two ambitious go-getters who had survived the Great Depression and went to California to try to open a number of businesses. They tried to work in the film industry. They tried to create a hot dog cart. They experimented with barbecue in the early menu, which is on this slide. But they really found that in order to maximize profits and to have a successful business, they should really limit their menu to burgers, fries, and drinks. And in creating this model of efficient food delivery, they were able to lower costs and bring in lots of customers. And slowly but surely, they opened other locations in California and Arizona. But the McDonald's that we know today was actually established by a man named Ray Kroc in the 1950s. Ray Kroc is often considered the father of modern McDonald's franchising, in which he was selling the concept to people who would open their stores in specific locations. The civil rights history of McDonald's is so important because for many people, when they hear about the history of segregation, when they hear about groups like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and their fight against segregation, they often think about the um, corner uh, drugstores or the lunch counters of places like Woolworths or Rexall Drugs. We've all seen the footage of the 1960s where well-dressed African-American and white students would try to test the laws of segregation. But very few people realize that McDonald's is part of that history. McDonald's outlets in cities like Memphis, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, Raleigh, and Durham, North Carolina, they all bent to the rules of segregation. And so they were also targets of a lot of civil rights activism, but we don't consider McDonald's as part of that history. And one of the reasons that I think that we often don't lump in McDonald's with some of these places that practice, practice segregation is because of what unfolded next. And that was McDonald's movement from a vision of suburbanization to the center of urban life in the 1960s and 70s. So in tracing a fast food civil rights story, I think about the way that McDonald's contributed to some of the most important forces of racism and racial exclusion in the early 20th century, whether it's its dependence on the highway system, which ravaged so many communities of color, whether they were so, or the fact that they were so focused on residential communities, suburbs that had strategically excluded African-Americans from moving and buying homes there, or the fact that so many of the early entrepreneurs who opened McDonald's franchises were able to take advantage of their whiteness in order to secure bank loans, in order to finance their companies. All of these different institutions that propped up McDonald's were all predicated on racial exclusion. And that needs to also be part of the McDonald's narrative and the McDonald's story. Because often when we look at business histories of McDonald's, they focus on innovation, they focus on their marketing, particularly marketing to children. And they tell the story as if it is a racially neutral story of people having good ideas and implementing it. But in the middle of that story is an American story of racial injustice and the ways that McDonald's was able to prosper into the early and mid 1960s using a racially exclusionary um, game plan that was so endemic of institutions in the United States. But all of this changes in 1968 after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, as I mentioned earlier. And I talk about it um, in terms of this age of Black capitalism. And Black capitalism is just the idea that African Americans should invest in their own wealth building in order to bridge the gap between what is part of the government's promise to all of its citizens and what is not delivered to people because of their race. And so in this gap is 
a lack of funding for public schools, a lack of funding for public resources like parks and pools, a lack of opportunities for well-paying jobs for all people. So in that gap came a lot of Black-owned businesses that felt like that they could make the difference. And so there's a great history of Black-owned businesses like funeral homes and beauty shops and um, grocery stores, all of these businesses that not only collect, uh, not only conducted their narrowly defined business, but were also very much invested in trying to create funds for all of the programs and the projects that were not being funded by the government. And I think that in the late 1960s, Black-owned businesses were not only filling the gap, but people turned to and invested in them because they believed that they could bring in the economic power that communities needed in order to get the resources that they so desperately needed. And so Burgers in the Age of Black Capitalism is this idea that McDonald's then begins to recruit African-Americans to franchise their McDonald's locations. And often these locations were ones that white franchise owners no longer wanted. They were places that had been at the center of some of the racial uprisings. They were places that had demographically shifted because of white flight, and they no longer wanted to do business in these predominantly black areas. So they left these businesses and sometimes moved to businesses in the suburbs. And in their place um, came African-American franchise owners who really wanted this opportunity. And it was an immense opportunity to be offered in the late 1960s because of all of the barriers to business ownership for African-Americans. And so you see that there's a plaque at this McDonald's location on the south side of Chicago that says on December 21st, 1968, this location was franchised to the first McDonald's African-American owner operator. And it's no coincidence that this opening happens about nine and a half months after King's assassination. There's no coincidence that this happens in a part of Chicago that had changed demographically from majority white to black. And it isn't a coincidence that there was an African-American who is the first to join the system, who joins the system under the premise that he will then take over a business that is abandoned by a white owner. And this issue continues to shape how African-Americans enter Black franchising. What's also really interesting is that a lot of these men who are franchise owners are really well known to the Black press. They get a lot of coverage because of the barriers that they're breaking in terms of economic opportunity. And McDonald's is really popular. Although McDonald's at this point isn't the largest fast food company, if you could believe it, it is growing in its um, financial strength and it's growing in its concentration into African-American communities. And so they called this the Black Stores Initiative. And so they would find men like Herman Petty, who's um, uh, photographed in the center, uh, Leonard Bennett, who's on his um, left, and Willie Wilson, who never becomes a franchise owner, but is quite the colorful character in Chicago politics. They become the backbone of operating restaurants in Black communities and realizing that the Black community really does take to McDonald's, some of it because there's so few competition in the restaurant space, because so many restaurants have closed and are not able to compete economically with McDonald's, but there's also a real concentration on Black consumers, them enjoying something that was, was once off limits to them because of their race. And so this actually fuels a lot of social movements where people are debating how McDonald's should operate in Black communities. In the third chapter of the book, I focus on a conflict in Cleveland, Ohio, around who has the right to franchise a McDonald's in a Black community. There is an argument that emerges from a kind of pro-Black group called Operation Black Unity. Here they are. They become an umbrella organization of different civil rights groups, different Black power groups on the east side of Cleveland. And in this case, they're not protesting because McDonald's refuses to serve them, which was an issue in an earlier period in the civil rights movement. Their critique of McDonald's emanates from the fact that it is white franchise owners who are making lots of money in Black communities and not responsibly investing in those communities. And these are the types of arguments we hear today that fuels a lot of the critique of how business is done in Black communities. 
So what Operation Black Unity does is they mount a protest of McDonald's on the east side. And the fight between this group and McDonald's corporate with the mayor in the middle, uh, Louis Stokes, who is the first Black mayor of Cleveland and is often credited as the first Black mayor of a major city, he's stuck in the middle politically because he wants to show both white and Black voters that he could represent them equally, but he also understands that as these McDonald's locations are losing money because of the boycott. It's becoming a politically sensitive issue about the limits and extent of Black power in this community. And so people are really, 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 um, you know, they're really stressed out about how this is going to unfold. And I really wanted to focus on these moments before McDonald's becomes the global powerhouse that it is today to think about how communities are trying to understand what is the role of fast food in their community? What do they think of the food? What do they think of the marketing? And what do they think of the impact they have on the local level? Because Operation Black Unity was arguing in part that McDonald's should pay for a community pool. They should pay for parks. They should be a lever in the community and that community people should be able to buy steaks into a McDonald's, have a share and use that share to reinvest. And it's this really kind of powerful moment in which it's not clear who's going to win, the big guys or the little guy, but ultimately the arguments about what fast food is and isn't continues in other parts of the country. One of the fascinating uh, stories that I uncovered was a protest at McDonald's in Portland, Oregon in the predominantly black Albina neighborhood of McDonald's. And this is a picture from um, FBI and police surveillance of a McDonald's location that was under protest in the 1970s. And at the heart of this conflict was McDonald's refusal to contribute to the free breakfast program for children that the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense had created. Many of you have probably heard about the advocacy that the Black Panther Party did in providing meals for children who were struggling academically because they were hungry. And so the free breakfast program for children predated the national free breakfast program that we have in public schools today. And they were providing food for children. And they said, look, if we're doing this, the local McDonald's should donate some eggs and some you know, sausage and some bread so that we can feed our community. And when McDonald's says no on the local level, there's an eruption between the two forces and there is a bombing at the McDonald's. And there's a lot of questions as to who's really responsible. There's a lot of reasons to believe the Black Panther Party did not do it. But ultimately, the protest about McDonald's starts to open up a conversation about a number of issues. One, who has the right to make money in a Black community? What are they owed a Black community? And what does it actually mean to have a franchise in a community? It's not a local business in a lot of ways, but the ways that McDonald's was representing franchising as well as Black franchising especially was that it was particularly connected to the community. And so the Portland conflict raises a lot of questions. And here's Kent Ford, who is head of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense at the Breakfast Program. And he is joined by other people across the country who are questioning McDonald's as well, whether it's in the Ogunst neighborhood of Philadelphia, where a community group argues that they're not even anti-fast food, and they don't even think that all McDonald's should be franchised by African-Americans in their community. What they have a problem with is that the city council approves the opening of a new fast food restaurant without talking to them, that this was about community control and asking for resources like mental health counseling and libraries and a recreation center for youth instead of bringing more fast food into their community. Um, similarly, as McDonald's becomes a voice in Black capitalism, and this Black capitalism initiative is supported by the federal government through the Office of Black um, of Minority Enterprise, through um, a, number, a number of initiatives by President Richard Nixon, who also supported the minimum wage bill from our opening poll question. The government at this time was very pro-Black business because they argued that they wouldn't have to worry about the messy details of school integration or equal access to housing 
if they invested in black owned businesses, then things would be kept separate and away from these larger goals of the civil rights movement. And so in many ways, the endorsement of black capitalism, both from a left and right perspective, they met in the middle to say, well, if we're going to have segregated communities, if we're going to have the separation of people, they might as well have communities that are generating wealth. So black capitalism was very much a conservative idea and a liberal idea all at the same time. And so as the federal government was providing more and more grants for minority owned businesses, as they were called at the time, giving grants, black entrepreneurs and black celebrities wanted in on the game. So people like the boxer Muhammad Ali started his own business called Champ Burger. And this was considered a real um, socially conscious investment vehicle because that way, um, um, that way black people could profit from what happened at Champ Burger. Similarly, the gospel music star, Mahalia Jackson, lent her image to a fried chicken company, which actually had its opening day in Memphis in 1968, days after King's assassination. And that was just a coincidence. But all of these businesses argued that McDonald's was not authentically black owned, but our businesses are. And in doing that, they're really contributing to these racial politics of solidarity, right? If you're going to spend your money anywhere, it's got to be a place that's black owned and we actually care about our communities. None of these businesses are able to compete with McDonald's because McDonald's has an incredible access to wealth and capital that these companies will never have. But nonetheless, the different political debates surrounding a fast food restaurant really surprised me in the research process because people took it so seriously. And they really felt like this was an issue that could secure a financially stable future. And they felt like their investment had to be taken seriously because ultimately business and capital is what allowed you to have a seat at the table to be able to negotiate on behalf of your community. And as the popularity of McDonald's grows um, throughout the 1970s and 80s, advertising plays an incredible role in this process. And so one of the things that I always kind of knew about, especially growing up in Chicago, was the incredible work of advertising agencies like Burrell Communications in advertising major brands to Black communities in the legacy publications of Jet and Ebony, magazines that were very, very popular um, for most of um, their existence until, pop until magazines became less popular in the digital, digital age. Nonetheless, advertisements like this that represent the Black nuclear family, as well as the sponsorship of the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday after its passage in 1983, were some of the ways that through Black franchise owners and through these Black advertising agencies, McDonald's contributed, in my opinion, a lot to Black cultural politics and representation. And so we see this continue in the way that McDonald's sponsors things like gospel tours. In the 1980s, when I was a kid, there was a lot of uh, sponsorship of things like Double Dutch and the All-American Double Dutch League. There was sponsorship of um, the All-American basketball game, which the other night I was watching uh, women's basketball for the NCAA championships, and I saw an advertisement that the boys basketball game was going to be on TV. And before social media, before YouTube, before Twitter, before TikTok, these were the places in which people were really looking at cultural forms that reflected um, their experiences. So advertising was really, really important. And I think it's also really important to note that a lot of black actors and producers and musicians, they got their start in commercials and getting a McDonald's commercial was considered a big break in those areas of performance. You know, a lot of um, at, a lot of companies use black athletes to promote their products today, whether it's like LeBron James or, um, or um, what else am I thinking? I'm thinking of the guy who used to play in the Washington team whose name is escaping me. But a lot of very famous African-Americans promote various brands, whether it's, you know, Mary J. Blige or Drake, whoever. But, you know, in the 1980s, this was not as common. And this was also not a practice that a lot of um, companies wanted to do because they felt it was too risky, that white consumers would not expect not accept 
and not endorse the idea of a black representative of a brand. But McDonald's really kind of broke that open with people like Gladys Knight, with Michael Jordan, with the Williams sisters. All of these black celebrities showed that they could reach a wide audience and that although McDonald's did participate in what they call ethnic marketing or segmented marketing, there was a sense that you could use black celebrities in this way. And I think Michael Jordan was the most important of the black celebrities who represented the McDonald's brand for many years. And so in thinking about the cultural work, I think that for me, it was really important to acknowledge that there is a lot of fun in this world, that we critique fast food because of the nutritional content, because of the practices of the industry. And I think those critiques are right, but I also wanted to acknowledge that this powerful cultural work is also important to people, that people identify with these commercials, that it has a lot of nostalgia. And the power of that representation and that power of that recognition is something that we can't ignore, even if we are very upset about um, you know, calories and sodium levels. And so I continue in this exploration to think about the conflicts that emerge as a result of this opportunity. So in the 1960s, McDonald's opens the door to African-American franchise owners, but it has implications. And so what eventually happens in the 1970s and 80s is that there are a number of conflicts about how open these opportunities are. And there's a lawsuit that is filed by a Black franchise owner who says that he's essentially being segregated in all Black communities that McDonald's has all of these locations, but if you are black, you're often in the inner city and that there's a disparate cost to running a business. There's a disparate um, kind of um, set of standards of how your business operates and that you can never expand outside of the inner city. And these conversations about whether or not these investments, how much justice did they really bring to black communities starts to um, ignite a lot of questioning of the fast food industry and its strategies. But what's really interesting to me is the number of ways that local chapters of groups like the NAACP and other civil rights organizations become very pro-franchising. And even when they threaten boycotts of McDonald's, even when they go on television to say, you know, don't shop at McDonald's until we get a fair settlement, a lot of the settlements are fueling the expansion of McDonald's locations. So if someone like Jesse Jackson, who's pictured here, says that his organization, People United to Save Humanity, are going to come together and boycott McDonald's, when McDonald's and Jesse Jackson start to negotiate about how to end a boycott, what they focus on is more Black-owned restaurants, more Black-owned advertising firms working for McDonald's, more Black-owned banks getting deposits of McDonald's money, or more Black-owned insurance companies getting insurance policy business from McDonald's. But what they fail to include are workers. And I think that this is the really great missed opportunity of this kind of protest, that a lot of the focus was on creating more Black business people, but not really thinking about the conditions of Black and Brown workers in the fast food industry. And this is one of the long-term um, consequences of this strategy in the 1960s that I think people couldn't imagine how expansive and pervasive fast food would become. And finally, I end um, my story kind of with one of the points of curiosity that was interesting to me. I thought a lot about 1968 and the death of Martin Luther King and the urban uprisings that ignited as a result. And I thought a lot about Ferguson, Missouri in 2014 while I was writing the book and the ways that some of the unfinished business of racial injustice ignited again. But somewhere in the middle of those two uh, points was the uprising in Los Angeles in 1992, after four police officers were acquitted for the beating of Rodney King. And for those of you who are not familiar with that history and that historical moment, it was the first time that we had what we would call viral video of an instance of police brutality that was captured by just an observer that was videotaped and that videotape was sent to the local news and circulated all over the world. The ways that um, we can like see the type of violence that erupts over and over again on social media. Um, during the Rodney King era, this was the first time I think people were able to see it in that way. 
With that being said, the Los Angeles uprising that was ignited after the acquittal of those four officers was a really important formative moment in my young life as a student in junior high watching a major American city, a portion of it burn. And after the unrest was settled in Los Angeles, uh, the first week of May in 1992, McDonald's issued a statement saying that none of their restaurants in South Los Angeles, which was the kind of heart of the uprising, were harmed because of their socially progressive connections to the African-American community that started in 1968. And I thought that was such a strange and inappropriate thing to say that I started to get really curious about the relationship between McDonald's and Black communities and racial injustice and unrest. And that's what really launched me to wanting to tell this story and wanting to really focus on the set of circumstances that brings a fast food restaurant into a community and allows that fast food company to be so confident in that choice that 25 years later, it frames its market saturation in terms of justice. I don't think that the opening of Black-owned McDonald's is justice. And I acknowledge the ways that this moment was significant for so many people, both in the fast food industry and outside of it. And it allowed, um, it created the template for how a lot of major businesses do business in Black communities. And it also forces us to think about the consequences of what happens when a business plays such an important and pivotal role in communities because of a lack of care and consideration by the federal government. And so ultimately, what I hope my book does is help us create new narratives when we think about our critiques and our concerns about fast food. We know today that so much of how we talk about fast food focuses on eating, what people eat, what they shouldn't eat, what they do eat, which I think is important to an extent. And we also know so much about the fast food industry through the practices of labor and groups like the Fight for 15 that are trying to expose the indignities of low wage, high stress work that makes people susceptible to injury, that can make them susceptible to disease, that can make them susceptible to burnout for very low wages. But there's something else that we need to talk about. And we need to talk about the ways that fast food and the history of fast food is as much about what people are not receiving as it is for what people ingest. And so I hope as students of the food systems, students of food justice, that you really do see history and its applications as integral to the work that you wish to do in this space. Because I think that without history, we're formed, we are forced to contend with just seeing what's in front of us while what's behind us is so critically important to understanding how we got here. And so on that note, I will join in the Q&A portion. Um, I know some questions are being added to the Q&A function and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Hi there, thank you so much for that amazing talk. And I think everyone's gonna be really inspired by what you said and everything like that. So thank you again so much for bringing that to us. And yeah, we can get going with the Q&A. Of course, um, I think Megan's popping some more in the chat, but if anyone else has any questions, there is not a bad question to ask and please go ahead and put it in the Q&A. But to get going, I'll start with the one that I can see in the Q&A. You can probably see it as well. I'll go ahead and read it and then you can respond. But it says from an anonymous attendee, thank you for this talk. Why do you think McDonald's leaned into the ethnic marketing and opened up the door for Black representation in their ads? Did it have to do with the growing interest for Black-owned franchises and support for Black capitalism? So we can go ahead and check that's an that. Excellent, that's an excellent question. So what happened with um, McDonald's was two things. One, the experimentation in trying to go into Black communities it was kind of a low level investment because they were going to recruit black um, franchise owners, it seems, but um, King's assassination ignited a lot of federal programs that helped pay for some of it. So it wasn't a huge risky move if they had a black franchisee come into the system and didn't do well because McDonald's for the most part owns the land in which their restaurants are built. So they have incredible wealth in real estate. 
So they never really lose out. If they lose a franchisee, they can always bring someone else in. Um, the other part of it was that these federal subsidies that these men, and they were all men, were eligible for also made it less risky. But the important part about all of this is, is that um, they didn't know how successful their restaurants were going to be in Black communities. And when these Black-owned franchisees showed how much money they were making and how often people were going to McDonald's, it really forced McDonald's to want to create more what they call Black stores back then. But the advertising and marketing piece was because so many of the Black franchise owners were upset because every um, franchisee at that point was paying 1% of its profits to McDonald's national advertising pool, but they weren't seeing ads in any of the Black newspapers or publications, and they weren't any ads that were really relevant to Black consumers. And so they brought in the idea of using a Black marketing firm to sell the product and they did so well um you know and so this is this is how it's done right they proved that they could um, bring a lot of money in and so mcdonald's put you know the money in as well so you know it, it all of these issues came together and what we see in the ads and the number of ads is just the fact that it's really successful and they want to make more money awesome thanks for that answer and then we have a second question from an anonymous attendee. How do you think the new fast food minimum wage in California, $20, is going to affect Black-owned fast food franchises and their Black employees? Do you think this will have unintended negative impact? It could, and I'll tell you why. Um, so there was a lawsuit in 2020 that was filed by more than 50, maybe 52 Black franchise owners. And what they were arguing were some of the same arguments that were made um, that I talk about in the book in the lawsuit in the 1980s that, um, you know, if you are Black, you will be put in a predominantly Black neighborhood. Your security costs are often higher. Your real estate taxes are higher because you're in, um, or your city taxes are higher because you're usually in a major city. Um, you have more issues in terms of just infrastructure, you know, that come with city living and that your um, insurance costs are higher. And so by putting all of the stores by putting all the Black franchisees in these areas, they're also competing with each other because they're in places that have a high concentration of restaurants and lots of fast food. And when people are saying, you know, we need to be in the suburbs, we need to be other places, um, they claim allegedly that they're not given those opportunities in the same way. So how does that impact the wages? So you are an employee of that franchise. You're not an employee of McDonald's. And the National Labor Relations Board has gone back and forth on this because of these issues of accountability. And what has often happened when their wage increases is that they're usually happening in major metropolitan areas that is that, that are more likely to have Black franchise owners. And Black franchise owners are often argue that they are not making as many, um, they don't make the same profits as their white counterparts. They have fewer stores and their stores cost more to um, run. And so one of the estimates from the lawsuit, I believe was, that a black franchisee makes $60,000 less than their white counterpart. And so when you look at um, these increase in wages, they will make the argument that it has a disparate impact on them. Now, that rhetoric is often used to try to suppress campaigns towards unionization or to raise wages. So I think that that argument, I'm always very careful about talking about because um, this is how a lot of companies evade you know, raising wages. They say, well, we can't afford it or it's going to be too hard. But with Black franchise owners, they have often made the case to their own employees and within their own communities that they are not making as much money as their white counterparts so that these um, that these decisions have a disparate impact on them. Interesting. I definitely didn't see it from that angle, so I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, I have a couple other questions that were in the chat, and I'll also put this in the chat for you to read. But the one of the first questions is, how do you think modern advertising and PR continues this trend of Black business owners or elites, but ignoring the Black working class? Well, I mean, I think it's all about the fantasy culture of um, of advertising. It's kind of, we're in a weird moment in advertising because of um, social media, where we're constantly, people are constantly selling us stuff, and we don't know who they are, right? Like, it, it could be me posting and saying, oh my gosh, I love this restaurant. 
everyone should go. I'm now working for this restaurant in this really indirect way, even if I'm not getting paid, right? There's a kind of promotion culture that is constant. And so what happens is the fantasy of wealth and the fantasy of capitalism is now um, brought to us in a way that's even more tailored to our interests. So, you know, when I was a kid, if there was a, a, a commercial that was about like a luxury car, um, you know, I'm 11, I don't care about luxury cars. So I watch the commercial and I kind of, you know, shrug. But now if I'm 11 and I have a phone and there's an algorithm, it knows what it's going to, what my 11 year old self would really want, right? And the fantasy life of wealth that way. And I think that, you know, advertising and hustle and grind culture and, you know, um, people who influence in various ways, talking about black wealth, it's being obsessed with Jay-Z and Beyonce being billionaires. All of that stuff contributes to a culture that will always obscure working people. And it it pushes away this, you know, the question of, is there a problem with being poor or is it the fact that to be poor in America is to not have your dignity respected, right? Are we thinking about a world with no poor people or are we thinking about a world with no need? And so it's, it, you know, it, it gets into our head. And I always say that, you know, I write books taking down this issue and I get sucked in, you know, I'm buying stuff on Instagram for no reason and thinking to myself, why did I even want that? It's because it's been presented to me so many times as, as doing things that um, material objects can't do. Right. Okay, great. Um, we have a couple more questions that came in the Q&A before I get to some of the other ones in the chat. So the another anonymous attendee has said, how did these food redlining practices contribute to more unequal and consequently worsening health outcomes for BIPOC? How can policy address the legacy of these ongoing issues today? Well, a large part of what happens during this period of time is that the Small Business Administration creates all of these um, minority business programs. They're happening all over the country. People are getting mentors, they're getting advice, but the kind of businesses that actually get funded and are actually viable are fast food franchises. People are trying to open little coffee shops and bookstores and small scale manufacturing, and they don't have the financial resources and there's no investment for them. There's a period of time that the Small Business Administration will not certify grocery stores as small businesses, but fast food franchises are. And so you already see the kind of financial incentives for focusing on one type of business over, um, you know, over others. And grocery stores are very low margin businesses. You have a critical mass of the offerings that they have. Um, they rot and they decay, right? So the second something goes into the grocery store, you have to sell it before it goes bad. You need a lot of square footage for a lot of grocery stores. And so Grocery stores had no kind of, there's no reason that they would want to develop in the places that fast food, which has shelf-stable food that has, you know, a lot of capacity to feed a lot of people quickly. So a lot of food doesn't um, hang around. You don't need tons of square footage. There's a lot of reasons why um, this business model starts to reign supreme over the other one. And, you know, addressing this legacy is, I think we have to advocate for really high standards for business so that we don't have to worry about businesses seducing communities with you know, a park or a scholarship to let them in because we have free college, because we have all of the resources we need. I think we really, really need to have incredibly high standards for employers to provide childcare, paid sick leave, all of those basics. And then the companies can focus on doing what they do, selling what they sell, but we know that workers don't um, aren't sacrificed as a result. Great answer. Thank you for that. Um, the next question I see is, how do you think the principles of Black capitalism have changed in the present? Um, I just think that they haven't changed that much because I think that the promises are still the same, that um, there's this idea that if you can become really rich, then you can shield yourself from the indignities of racism. And we know that's not true. And so what we see in a lot of the Black capitalism talk today is that if you hustle hard enough, you can kind of um, wall yourself off from the realities um, of race that um, don't protect anyone. But I also think that black capitalism today is internalized politically. So you start to see people talking about, you know, well, Trump is bad in this way, but he's good because he promotes black business. It becomes a talking point um, to, to paper over 
the um, the racism and the injustices perpetuated by individuals and systems. Um, but you know, today it's just it's online. It's on my phone. Um, you know, there was a period of time, I guess, someone would have to actually seek out um, people with that ideology. <laughs> Excuse me. And now they're just, you know, kind of delivered in my Instagram, no matter how, how much I don't linger on it. I think that we are enveloped in the idea at this moment. Yes, exactly. And bless you. <clears throat> um, I, I'm going to take another question that I had in the chat. It's kind of related to some of the things we were just speaking about. But in your research from your book, did you learn of other fast food restaurants using similar tactics to McDonald's of Black capitalism or strongly influencing Black culture, such as celebrity endorsements? Yeah, so the second that McDonald's proves that they have gotten um, a system here that makes a lot of money that people will go to these Black-owned franchises, Burger King follows up and then KFC and then you know, I write about in my book, these attempts at black owned franchises, they try to compete with the big guys. They can't, they do not have the capital because I give an example of a Baltimore based chicken franchise called Chicken Charlie's that was actually really popular. There's no way that this guy can compete because um, KFC, Popeye's, Church's Chicken, they can issue um, coupons. They can take a hit financially that smaller businesses can't. And so Every fast food company uses this model of minority franchising of ethnic marketing because they see how well it works for McDonald's. Great. Um, I'm going to go to this middle question first uh, from Anonymous. You mentioned that during segregation, there was a lot of Black business and a focus on bettering the Black economy to upkeep the segregation. I remember my grandfather talking about Black Wall Street, and when integration happened, a lot of Black business and Black economy dwindled down. Any thoughts? So yeah, so this is very true that, you know, integration opens up the possibility for people to shop, to live, and to do a lot of different things if they are in the class position to have a lot of choices. But one of the things that um, I think is really important to note about the, what they say, the decline of Black businesses or Black Wall Street, some of it isn't because of in integration. Some of it is because of um, Black business not having the capital to weather major financial hits. I think that we often think of it as a story of Black consumers abandoning Black business, but I think we often don't see how precarious Black businesses have always been because of their inability to borrow, their ability to get lines of credit, uh, one of the best books about Tulsa's Greenwood community is called Built from the Fire by Victor Luckerson, because he doesn't necessarily focus on just the Tulsa, you know, race massacre and the businesses that were lost. He talks about the federal policies that made it impossible to rebuild the insurance companies that didn't pay people, um, even though they had paid their premiums, it, the different uh, city policies that redevelop parts of Tulsa to make it really hard for business. So I think that that is one of many factors that has hurt Black business historically. Interesting. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'm going to move to the question from Jennifer Bay. Do you believe Black investment will help eliminate food apartheid? Do you think Black capitalism is becoming an issue that harms Black America? Um, black investment will never help to eliminate food part apartheid because um, it wasn't a lack of black investment that caused it. And so I really do believe that um, there is a dangerous thing that goes into your second question, this idea that if you have more black owned businesses, you have a more just economy. You don't. Um, just economies are formed by government aid and direct assistance to communities and our taxes being spent in a very specific way. I see that a lot of people want to put a lot of pressure on black owned businesses to um, figure out a lot of problems that they didn't cause. And so the majority of black owned businesses in the United States do not, um, do not employ more than one person, the owner of the business. And so the idea that black businesses would then help with unemployment or be able to make these large scale investments, they just can't. Um, it's small business isn't designed to do it, but I do think federal policy and nationalized um, services have the capacity to do that. So I think we need national grocery stores. I think that um, private grocery, grocery stores um, are exacerbating the issue, but I think if we really are 
concerned about food justice, then we have to think about where's the most money available to feed people, and that's within our, our public resources. Great. Um, I think someone just had asked you to repeat the book oh. title about Tulsa. The book is called Built from the Fire. Built from the Fire. Great. Thank you. And then another question um, up top, Princess, uh, are companies weaponizing ethnic marketing in the present day, in your opinion? Um, I don't know what you mean by weaponizing. I think what they are doing is ethnic market is, uh, marketing is done cynically often. Um, I think that there's an assumption that if people can see themselves, then they will um, then they will invest in something, they'll buy a product. Um, what you do see today is this really interesting thing. I teach a class about um, marriage laws called Sex, Love, and Race in American Life and Culture. And that looks at the ways that um, companies use uh, multiracial families, interracial couples to try to signal their progressive values. But it's for things like Swiffer, you know, <laughs> products that I don't know if you're thinking about racial politics a lot when you buy it, but sometimes it's done um, in a kind of subtle way to indicate something about the value of that company, which is which is part of the strategy of a different way of marketing products that focuses on um, this idea of a raceless uh, future, which can also be problematic. Thanks for that response. Um, and then we have another anonymous attendee says, thank you for your presentation. The more I learn about history, the more impressed I am about how radical and truly asset building the Black Panthers work was for which they were destroyed. Um, what lessons can we learn from them? I feel the efforts funded by federal and local funds just do not have the structure to build up communities. Well, I think that what we can learn from the Black Panther Party is a balance between two things. The idea that um, communities have the solutions uh, to community problems and that you have to be unabashed in appealing to the state. Part of the genius of the Black Panther Party is they had a very clear understanding of state and, and federal constitutions. They worked within the parameters of the law to expose its inadequacies, but they were not removed from political process. They ran for office. They tried to influence you know, school boards. They tried to create programs that um, they could then apply for federal funds for. So they were not necessarily 100% anti-state, but they had a robust critique of the state. And they challenged this idea that you know, one person, one vote, one person um, you know, matters into the larger fabric. So I think that balance is really interesting. And you see the ways that their actions, the very actions that did destroy the party, were then co-opted and adopted by the federal government because they understood the power of it. Um, you know, I think that the free breakfast program might have been hastened because of what they saw the Black Panther Party doing. And so um, the other great book that I want everyone to read is called Body and Soul about the Black Panther Party's health programs. And a lot of them were in Oregon where people were, um, you know, they were using um, the University of Oregon's um, medical school and dental school and these young residents who wanted to test people for sickle cell anemia, sometimes in the parking lot of a McDonald's um, in order to deliver public health in ways that hadn't been done before. And so I think that there is something really important about, um, um, oh, I'm sorry, wrong, but I'm sorry. The body and soul I'm talking about is by Alondra Nelson. I'm sure there's a lot of body and souls. Alondra, I'm sure that one is good too. Body and soul by Alondra Nelson and built from the fire uh, by Victor Luckerson, uh, after you read franchise. Um, but, um, you know, there's there's all of these great ideas. And I think it's also about building on the capacity and power of everyone who can have a, a role and who can have a position. Great. Um, and then I have another question in the chat, which I might pronounce something wrong. So let's jump in if, if not. Um, it says, in response to the Black capitalism conversation on the topic of Black capitalism and its endorsement from pro-segregation conservatives, what do you think about Alufemi Otaiwo oh, yeah. okay, of elite capture and how the rise of multimillionaire or billionaire Black celebrities might promote racial capitalism and further drive inequality? Um, everything he says is right. Um, my former colleague um, is absolutely right. I think the, the problem with um, elite capture 
is that the terms of struggle um, become available to everyone. And I think we definitely see that in the story of McDonald's franchise owners. So yes, McDonald's franchise owners who are Black do have a distinct struggle compared to their white counterparts. But the question is, are they then the poster um, example or are they the most important example in trying to fight racism? I don't, you know, I would say not really. But there's a way that, um, you know, a millionaire not being able to be a billionaire becomes um, this incredibly, you know, I, there's a way in which you can both, um, there's a way in which you can both understand that no one is immune to the powers of racism, but then make a distinct choice as to what is the critical term and what is the critical fight in order to eradicate racism. Great, thank you. And then some of the questions that I ask certain people when I interview people for our Sustainable Food Systems website is a, two things I kind of wanted to bring up. The first one is if there are students out there who are interested in kind of getting into your work, obviously, other than reading your book um, and, and other books you plugged, are there any other things um, that you would recommend students like get involved with? I just listen to the conversations. You know, we're we're running up to a presidential election that has all sorts of issues. But listen to the the buzzwords around um, business, around opportunity, and what the terms of them are. You know, if someone's running for office and they say more small businesses, you, your question is why, to what end? You know, if you see people who are, um, you know, pandering to communities of color with this idea of you too can be a business owner, you know, why, for to what ends? And I think that when you listen with that critical lens of understanding this history, I think you can discern, you know, the rhetoric from the reality of what's actually possible and where investment can come from. And all of us will not be millionaires, but we still have incredible gifts and we have an incredible legacy um, to offer. So I just always listen to the language of what people um, are imagining the, that we need and the realities of what people are saying that they need. Awesome. And I have one more in the chat I think we have time for before we do wrap up in a, in a little bit. Um, we have, I'm very curious to hear more about the use of mixed race families in advertising. When did this begin? And at what point in the last few decades did it become a more common practice? And with what historical events did it coincide? What are the implications of advertising in this way? Yeah, so you see a lot of it start in the mid 90s um you know um fashion brands like Benetton was very known for its controversial ads because they showed you know people kissing or holding hands across race um and then Levi's and then um when Tiger Woods became very popular there was a lot of kind of you know this is the future this is the future and the problem with a lot of that representation of mixed race people it suggests that they didn't exist in the past which isn't true and that they are going to usher in a future in which race doesn't matter. Um, the second turn that you see is that companies that were trying to, um, you know, suggest that there was a progressive way in which they understood the world would have families, you know, mixed race uh, couples and families, um, you know, living in the world in a way that um, suggested that um, there are places in which there isn't any scrutiny of their presence or there wasn't any racism. And you kind of see that with movies and television. There's a whole long history of how interracial relationships are represented as either a problem for white families and then later became a problem for Black families. And then we're starting to think about these, cult these ideas of culture and ethnicity. But ultimately, um, you know, when race is deployed in marketing, it is not done without a lot of careful research and a lot of people thinking about what can be the implications for the bottom line. That is so interesting. And I know you mentioned you teach a class on this. I can only imagine that that is equally as fascinating to continue to dive into those topics, which I know we don't, isn't always food related here, but still very interesting to know that you, you do that work as well. So, okay. I don't think I see any other questions. If anyone has any last minute, go ahead and throw them in. Otherwise I can turn it over to Margo to wrap us up. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk and thank you everybody for your questions.